um, it goes without saying <laughs> that uh, it is truly an honor um, to be here with y'all today and share my work. And uh, after those kind words, I think a special thanks to Andre Nascimento is in order. So thank you very much, Andre. <clears throat> I must say that my presentation is rated R. So listener's discretion is advised. <laughs> um, I'm gonna need to interact with you guys. So please um, give me some reaction if I ask you a question because I need to make sure that you are uh, listening to, to what I'm saying, to what I'm playing. So my name is Paulo Dutra. You see my information on the screen. Um, you can reach out if you want, if you need, uh, through those means. Um, let me check if my PowerPoint is working, if I click here. Okay, all right, okay. Here we go. <clears throat> As Todd Boyd points out, and I quote, rap music is the most visible form of African-American cultural expression in contemporary society. As a consequence, rap reached other popular and academic audience, not only locally, but also abroad, due to the impact of American culture influence worldwide. Although rap welcomes a vast variety of approaches from virtually any discipline in the humanities, I approach rap as poetry. This needs to be made clear. I, appro I approach rap as poetry. <clears throat> Whether in the United States or in Brazil, hip hop experienced a period when popular and especially academic approaches denied its artistic value. As Michael Eric Dyson noticed, there are few parallels to this heavy handed wrong headedness in the criticism of other art forms like films, plays, or visual art, especially when they are authored by non blacks. And certainly that cultural bias and unapologetic ignorance that informs men assaults on the genre remains a reality. As you guys can see in the next slide, many critics don't account for the complex ways that some hip hop artists play with stereotypes to either subvert or reverse them. Its critics often fail to acknowledge that hip hop is neither sociological commentary nor political criticism, though it may certainly function in those in these modes through its artist, artists' lyrics. Of course, Ice Cube's and Hassanize MC's lyrics introduce sociological commentary and political criticism. However, following, uh, following Dyson's approach, I shall concentrate my talk today on the artistic means and conventions through which they get their point across. There is at least one clear distinction between scholarship on rap in Brazil and in the United States. Regardless of their intended, intended outcomes, in the United States, racial issues in opposition to class struggle have been the chief element addressed by the critics. In Brazil, Critics develop an opposite, developed an opposite approach, approach, which favored discussions on class struggle over race and rap. As Jennifer Roth Gordon noticed, and I quote, while the press and public have lauded rappers' attention to socioeconomic inequality and conditions of daily life in Brazil's, Brazil's social and geographic periphery that has been overwhelming disdain for their direct discretion of Brazilian racism. <laughs> and such a posture, I think, is also truthful for scholars such as Brazilian scholars such as Ricardo Tepemer, who argues, and I quote, and it's my own translation. Hasanaise lyrics attack the perpetuation of inequality, racism, police violence, and other use of Brazilian society. Excuse me. They do so by assuming a clear position in a class structure in direct opposition to what they themselves understand as the ruling class. Tepperman makes no reference to the fact that the so-called ruling class in Brazil is majorly comprised of white people. 
The tradition of favoring class structure over race is one of the outcomes of the myth of racial democracy that ruled, and I believe still does, social relations in Brazil. That's why within the context of social democracy, overt racial conflict, legal separatism, and identity politics are readily viewed as un-Brazilian and socioeconomic class remains the most and the most common and accepted way to interpret inequality. Those words are Roth Gordon's. In the United States, as far as I know, segregation was detected and detected implied. Therefore, the establishment of a racial democracy was never contemplated. This is one fundamental difference, difference between African-American and Afro-Brazilian societies. While in Brazil, there is not even such a thing, a concept as Afro-Brazilian society, because Afro-Brazilians are physically and symbolic, symbolically, the lower social class in the United States, the existence of an African-American society with its socioeconomic classes is a reality. These facts have a great influence in how scholarship approaches rap in the two countries. Because class struggle with, within African-American society exists, Boyd believes that, and I quote, more often than not, questions of race dominate both popular and critical discussions about rap music. Though this discussion is undoubtedly important, Contemporary society, especially in the post Reagan Bush era, forces us to deal with the influence of the class struggle on African American society. The opposite, the opposite path is the more urgent one in the case of Brazilian rap's criticism. Though the discussions on class struggle are important, contemporary, contemporary re examination of the history of the rather uncordial race relations in Brazil should force us all to deal with the patent and central place race has in the aesthetics of Brazilian rap. In the interest of time, I will concentrate today, excuse me, on Ice Cube's track, I Wanna Kill Some 1991, from the album Death Certificate, <clears throat> and Racionais MC's track, Racistas Otários, 1990, from the album Holocausto Urbano. In order to discuss how they artistically address the contemporary experience of Black people. <clears throat> Oops. Playing with conventions of the time when albums used to have two sides, Cube feeds the listeners a taste of the album's structure and also a commentary in the introdu introdu introductory track, The Funeral. And please let me know with reactions if you can listen, if you, if you can hear. Niggas are in a state of emergency. The death side, a mirrored image of where we are today. The life side, a vision of where we need to go. So sign your death certificate. I hope you, you heard it. I, I didn't get any response, so I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> I meant like the reaction buttons down there. Uh, Okay, uh, metaphorically dying and being born again because its current reality of African-American culture needs a full reboot is the ultimate goal to be achieved according to the aesthetic purpose of the album. The urge directed <coughs> towards, excuse me, towards black people to take action, sign their own death certificate, and leave behind a way of life involves a change of mind and attitude before existence. And, and a social reality that drives black peoples to a real death sentence. The double voice play with the actual death of black people and the metaphorical one that shall purge black people's practices from the lingering legacies of slavery is therefore, is therefore the aesthetic basis of the whole album. In this process of disposing of where we are today and moving towards where we need to go, a truly complete, complete repagination is in order. Thus, side B poetically introduces and discusses possibilities for paths to be followed, ways to achieve the goal, and measures to be taken. Hence, 
it is only natural that the opening track of side B is titled The Birth, and the first actual track is I Wanna Kill Son. I Wanna Kill Son begins with an army recruitment procedure in which a strong voice resembling a drill sergeant claims that the army is the only way out for a young black teenager. Only then the rapper's voice comes to play. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. The first actual line of the rap is a straightforward, I wanna kill him because he tried to play me like play me like the, like the trick. I wanna kill him. He tried to play me like the trick, but just see, I'm the wrong nigga to fuck with. I got the A to the motherfucking A and it's ready to win. <clears throat> Excuse me. In conjunction with the next two lines, Ice Cube's artistic narrative basis is enacted, and I'm quoting Ice Cube. You write three verses, you write three acts. First act, you get to know the characters. Second act, you put them in a situation. Third act, you get them out of it. <clears throat> the characters are son and the narrative voice. The situation they are in is self-evident. The way to get them out of it is not a diplomatic one. The narrative voice describes exactly what his, his intentions are when he finally finds son. And that, that's what it is. The mere fact that son is not an actual person, but a symbol should suffice to prevent listeners from proceeding to a literal reading that should not supersede the even more obvious metaphorical meaning of obstructing son's mouth and hyperbolic 17 rounds may make the brains hang out. The offensive is directed towards a discourse and a way of thinking, the mouth and the brain, that must change because Sun, who seems to get the whole counter behind him, unfolds himself throughout the multi-layered non-corporeal apparatus, immune to physical confrontation or the establishment of a exact, an exact identity or location. Considering rap's intrinsic aesthetics and poetic resources, neither the arena in which the fights to be fought nor the weapons can be confused with real acts of violence, but rather understood as the conceptual realm and the kind of poetic creation that rap disseminates. The reason why the narrative voice is looking forward to the killing of the son is explained after in some kind of intermission in form of a dialogue between a woman and some men at the front door, <clears throat> in which an army recruitment attempt is enacted and explicitly exposed as a predatory practice, presenting, presenting hardly no transition between topics and time frames. The subsequent lines powerfully condense several periods of African American historical contact with Uncle Sam as well as a lingering consequence of such encounters. The predatory recruitment from the intermission is now narrated in detail that links the practice back to the slave traffic because Sun also came to the narrative voice house pretending to be friendly, excuse me. However, immediately after giving a dap, he draws a gun, rapes the mother in the house, ties up the person that in the narrative voice represents and throws him in a big truck packed like sardines. The truck was, and I quote, full of any word who fell for the same scheme. And from now on until the end of the stanza, the lyrics describes the slave traffic, the work as enslaved people, the breaking up of families, traditions and social relations and the assimilation into uh, Christianity. Differently structured from the previous one, the last stanza sets the time of the narrative in 1991, having the year 1991 as a starting point. The history is then told. Now in 91, he want to tax me. I remember the son of a bitch used to ask me. I hate me by a book to my neck snap. Now that sneaky motherfucker want a bad rap. Moving from Rio to symbolic violence. The lyrics mentions the initiatives towards censoring and banning rap due to the allegedly, which was actually um, a literal reading, uh, violent and obscene content of rap music in the 1990s. Through, the, through, sorry, through this me, 
who tacitly claims to embody the experience of all African Americans, Ice Cube blatantly set the irony behind his artistic endeavor by rhyming two verses that juxtapose the attempt to ban rap and the real and largely uncensored atrocities committed against people of African descent during the slave period. Even uh, Arrested Development recognized, and I quote, climb the trees my forefathers hung from. Surely Ice Cube is making reference to every time African Americans were approached by patriotic discourse in the main occasion military personnel were in higher demand in the history of the United States. However, since the so-called Gulf War was the more recent historical event, I think he's referring, of course, to that, the message is clear because before reaching the conclusion that Sun should fight his own wars, the narrative voice lists HIV AIDS and narcotics as means as a mean son systematically employed to keep black people from thriving. The real violence moves to the symbolic realm again when the narrative voice transits from all the listed forms of sabotage son has employed to, in, in the attempt to silence black people's voice through banning rap. Wait till we get over that, huh? Cause your ass is grass, cause I'm a brass, can't bury rap like you bury jazz. Cause we stop being whores, stop doing fools. And this is like my favorite uh, part, artistically speaking. After we recognize that there, re that there remains a hump yet to be overcome, in the three subsequent lines, Cube works the rhymes in such a way that highlights rap music. And I need to be technical here. There is one internal rhyme in the second line, rest and blast. None in the third, rap and jazz. And I know the vowels rhyme, but it's not a perfect rhyme. The latter rhymes with the previous line, jazz and grass. And another internal rhymes rhyme in the fourth line, horse and floors. I was not sure if I could say horse, but I just said, sorry. The only word in a position that would permit a rhyme, like I said, a perfect rhyme, but that finds no perfect phonological match is rap. And I try to highlight it for you guys so you can see it more clear, clearer. Therefore, nor even metaphoric, metaphorically, Uncle Sam can ban or bear rap because Hugh claims rap singularity and importance within the very lyrics he composed. Such a procedure had been announced previously when the narrative voice lists as one of the reasons for wanting to kill him that Sam, and I quote, tried to take a motherfucking chunk of the funk. And apologies for cursing a bit. The final line summarizes in one expression the reason why such a symbolic violence takes urgency. I wanna kill Sam because he ain't my motherfucking uncle. According to the narrative voice, the alleged welcome attitude of Sam finds no appealing for black people simply because the also alleged kinship that the designation uncle implies is not needed, desired, or recognized. <laughs> Excuse me, now I'm gonna jump into Hasistas Otario, Racist Suckers. <clears throat> a suspenseful beat followed by a drum and a pandeiro, which is a tambourine, and, and both are music instruments related to samba, a Afro-Brazilian um, rhythm, get the track started and announce the somber scenario the lyrics will discuss. From the very beginning, Hassanais state unequivocally that the target of racist attacks are poor people. Therefore, the message is clear. Black people in Sao Paulo are the lower social class. Gradually, <clears throat> excuse me, the racist suckers 
identity is revealed through uh, linguistic clues until the moment that there is no doubt that they are law enforcement personnel who fulfilling a higher power's mission frame black people on a daily basis in order to send them to prison. The subsequent lines after the refrain, Hasidus or Titus nos deixam em paz, resemble ice cubes because racionais then reflect on the long lasting process of manipulation and marginalization that historically drives black people to an everlasting state of uncertainty, which ultimately leads to criminality. Only after having set the tone and the scenario through the background sounds and the rhythm the lines deliver, racionais get to the point they want to get across. <clears throat> Excuse me. The rhythm is marked by an overemphasizing of most of the stressed syllabus in perfect synchrony with the background beat sound. Such an attention to details reveal, reveals from the beginning the concern with the artistic expression as a foundation for the message they want to convey. Although the system is cruel and racist, and I quote, sociologists prefer to be impartial and they say our dilemma is financial, which is a no discussion and an axiomatically imposed notion that can be tracked back to the rise of the myth of racial democracy. Hashanai challenged such a notion by embodying a we, in other words, uh, the actual people who leads uh, the attacks on a daily basis, in opposition to sociologists who coldly analyze the issue from a theoretical perspective, which is detached from objective reality. Mas analisamos bem mais, você descobre que negro e branco pobre se parecem, mas não são iguais. The lingering myth of racial democracy and its impact on black people's thought is what Hassan and I are ultimately discussing. Because systematically they point out throughout the lyrics the issue of misinformation that keep black people believing that any possible legacy of slavery has been eliminated by the abolition in, the, in 1888. Therefore, black people are unable to see through the fallacy fallas, fallas, fallacy of the racial democracy and blame themselves for the predicament they find themselves in. According to Hassanais, however, our reasons for fighting are still the same. Prejudice and contempt are still the same. We are black, we also have our ideals. It doesn't rhyme in English because it is a translation. Once more, through the embodiment of a we, Hassanais state explicitly that black people are not fully integrated into the Brazilian society, regardless of what impartial sociologist claims to the contrary. The fight is still active and so are the reasons to fight because, and I quote in translation, the powerful are disloyal cowards. They beat blacks on the street for no reason. At this moment, the lyrics state explicitly that the racist suckers are not the only problem but part of a larger and complex system of reality that lead black people to forget the rebellions, rebellions, fights and deaths of the enslaved ancestors in their quest for freedom and equality. Once again, Rasanais has resort to a we in order to denounce that white or black people's inaction is deeply rooted. They, the police, are actively cruising the streets looking for the usual suspects whose phenotypical attributes are unequivocal. Brazilian legislator Afonso Arinos anti-racism bill, which is considered uh, one of the first attempts to legally punish racist acts, is now 70 years old, roughly, and has been overcome by more strict ones that clearly define racism as a serious crime instead of a misdemeanor. In 1990, nonetheless, it was the only constitutional law dealing with racism available. Hassanais brought up into question the concrete lack of impact of such a law in the everyday lives of people of African descent. Once more, contrasting the distance between the distance 
got lost here. Between the theoretical and the objective world, they define, they define it as infallible in theory, useless in everyday life. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Furthermore, Hasanais plainly summarized the issue of racism in Brazil, which in theory does not exist, but remains effective. The discussion of the fissure between the theoretical and the actual everyday realm can only be achieved through art. Because just like James Baldwin once said, the artist is somebody that helps us see reality again. As a nice aesthetic goal in Racistas Otarius is an attempt at making black people see reality again. And they do this by creatively elaborating on the gap between the two realms in the more approachable language and aesthetic hip hop music provides. The lyric ends by repeating and reaffirming black people's existence as black people in a racist society, but not before delivering the final and this time sarcastic blow on the myth of racial democracy's rationale, which uh, as we know claims that Brazil is a country with a suitable climate to natural racial integration where there is no racial prejudice. O Brasil é um país de clima tropical, onde as raças se misturam naturalmente e não há preconceito racial. <risos> Such a message is delivered in a solemn, declamatory, and scholarly tone, but it is immediately interrupted in an overlapping effect by the worldwide, worldwide famous laughter from Michael Jackson's song. I think it's the thriller, the name of the song. This is not only a fine example of sampling, which, according to Dyson, is a transgressive activity because rappers employ it to interrupt the narrative flow and musical stability for, for of other musical texts. But it is also an orchestrated construction that poetically deals with form and content. This is what the sampling delivers, in my opinion. Another level of artistic effect, because in this case, the resource of sampling, excuse me, is transplanted from the realm of music into the realm of the ideological arena. What is really being interrupted is not a music, but the narrative flow and speech is stability of the myth of racial democracy. The laughter mocks the arrogant and fallacious content and form of scholarly discourse and language. But the laughter also lasts around two seconds more than the speech, and I, I clocked that. Um, so it is not interrupted until it is completed over, artistically claim more importance, and ultimately prepares the listener or the listeners to return to the lines that have already been sung and that will be the closing remarks along with the refrain line, which is also the first and last line of the rap. <laughs> Nossos motivos para lutar ainda são os mesmos, o preconceito de, e o desprezo ainda são iguais. Nós somos negros, também temos nossos ideais, racistas, otários, nos deixem em paz. I hope I still have time, because I want to share this. Um, but before doing this, I encourage you, you all to listen to the two songs. Even if you don't understand Portuguese at all, or even if you are not familiar with the vernaculars of rap you will notice that there is a clear difference between Hassanai's and Hassanai's cubes, attitudes towards the problem they discuss. The latter seems to be active while the former presents a more passive attitude. This can even be noticed in the tone and rhythm they both set for their poetic lines. Ice cubes is incisive and rapid while Hassanai's seems to me to be slow and somehow reflexive. 
the first lines of each rap denote such a difference because while Ice Cube, Ice Cube starts out with, I want to kill him, Hasu and I start out with, her sister sucker, leave us alone. Cubes is clear a representation of an I who is willing to act while Hasun I is request to be left alone. Cubes is chasing, I'm looking, and Hasun I are being chased. They cruise the streets. The last lines also demonstrate such a difference. Like I said, if I have time, I see no reaction, so I'm gonna play it. Aí. É, um, é um barato que eu sempre quis falar, esse negócio de preto e polícia. Ei, polícia, nós estamos aqui, não estamos moscando na sua. Eu vou fazer um uso para ver o que, que dá, eu vou começar a bater de frente também. Vou bater de frente e falar assim, chega, mano, agora é o seguinte, vocês vão me ouvir. Essa música, eu falo, racistas otários, me deixem em paz, mas também se não quiser paz, se vocês quiserem, eu quero. Se você for ouvir, é o que a música tá falando. Firmeza total, DMN. Aí! Ei! 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 Racistas ou otários, não deixem em paz. Pois as famílias pobres não aguentam mais. Uh, what you just saw, and I find it very interesting, is a different version of the, the, the lyrics in the rap. And it's sung by another group, DMN. You can find that on YouTube. And it shows a more assertive tone in an introductory speech by Manu Brown. Manu Brown, we can, we can say he's the leader of Hasunais and Mises. And though I'm still in, inquiring into the why, I have a preliminary conclusion that Hasunais were still experiment, experimenting with their technique and language, which is very different in their 1997 album, Surviving Hell, when they are much more assertive and poetic, just like Ice Cube. And I also think we, we need to remember that at that time, when Cube uh, launched Death Certificate, he was already a former member of uh, NWA, and had established himself as a uh, great lyricist. I think that's the word in English. Thank you. Obrigado. I'm, I'm very curious uh, uh, about kind of the contemporary political scene in Brazil and how whether and how you see that being trans, you know, uh, addressed within rap music or other other popular expressions. I mean, I found your presentation fascinating just for trying to understand the 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 music and the lyrics as as a form of poetry and then what it signifies um, about Brazil. And give, just given sort of the enormous political changes that have taken place over the last five or six years in Brazil, do you see that influencing the musical expression or the lyrics uh, or the cultural role that that you see rap music playing within Brazil? Um, I would say yes, not as not as as intensive as we would need or expect. But I think yes, uh, some some artists they are uh, tackling exactly uh, the current moment. Uh, but that is also the 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 um, the issue of i made okay let's go into the polem polemical <laughs> the issue of some of them say i'm not done i'm just gonna not speak to this guy he, he's unreasonable i'm not talking to him um uh, but in the realm of the of the actual lyrics and the rap and the raps um i would like to see more but again rap in Brazil is still seen as um, under, it's underappreciated, especially by um, academia. But um, it doesn't mean to say that academia is not studying rap, it is, but it's still somehow underappreciated. And I think it's really hard for us to uh, actually have an, a clear idea of what the impact is right now. I think we're gonna have to wait until history unfolds itself. And then we will maybe 
like I'm doing. I'm going back to the nineties, to the nineties, and and analyzing the lyrics to see um, what happened back then. Um, but uh, things things right now in Brazil are so um, confusing that most people are also confused, and. Uh, I, I'm guessing someone is gonna ask me about this, right? Ice Cube's in deep trouble now <laughs> because of what he said. Uh, <laughs> um, can I, Apollo, yeah. can I tag on to Ken's question? Sure. Um, because I listened to that album and then I went to uh, Where Is He Valois? And, um, do you see, I mean, aside from musical style getting more contemporary, what I like about them is that they, you can feel it. So whether you understand it or not, you feel the message that they're saying. And so your point about how they're slower and they, it seems like they enunciate, not enunciate literally, but figuratively what they're trying to get across. But so over time, so over the last two decades, let's say, do you really see any change in the message or do you see what I think some people like myself might see as a cycle that just keeps going and going and going? So is the message going to change or is it going to continue to be the stop repressing and stop holding down? Um, like, like, does the message really change because of politics or do you see just a cyclical problem where the lyrics continue to be similar? Um, I, I think the message is the same. It's just uh, better poetically. It's just better poetry now because they, they then found out their real um, voice. Um, I I have another another. I have a paper. It's published when I talk about specifics about um, hyper uh, hyperbaton things like that. When they found their their own way of of rapping, right? Um, but sadly, the message is still the same. I think it's just it's more poetic and sometimes. People may may think that they're not talking about the same thing anymore. It's it's just that they got better in yeah. their in their poetry, and uh, I'm guessing some I'm guessing other people from Brazil will say different. <laughs> will have a different stand, but for me, I left Brazil in 2006. I go there often. Well, not anymore because of all this what's happening, but. Uh, I don't really see, it's more exposed now, right? Mm -hmm. You see that on social media, you see the records of people getting um, brutalized by police and all that, uh, but it's been there. <laughs> it, yeah, it's been there. Uh, People are saying, oh, okay, this is happening now. No, this, this has been happening for a long time. It's just like, um, we are not, we are not keeping quiet anymore. We're using the, the social media social media to to bring awareness to voice to be to be vocal. But that is one thing that it's undeniable. The affirmative action in Brazil, which I think were was implemented in two thousand two, I may be wrong, it changed the scenario in the universities. When I was in college, I was probably the only two or three um, Afro-Brazilian uh, student, and I went to Brazil a couple of years ago to teach a class. Ninety-nine percent were Afro-Brazilians in the same in the class, so that changed. So, young people who are going to college and MAs and PhDs, they are um, more aware. They are aware of things now that I I was not when I was in college, because I had this uh, Eurocentric education which they are not well at least 
they are not fully uh the other case is still eurocentric but we 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 read the eurocentric uh education but we discuss it and not accept mm -hmm. okay thank you you're welcome who, who are speaking I... oh sorry i took a <laughs> question Yes, thank you, um, Paulo, for your presentation. Yeah. Um, I had a question in regards to um, the hyperbolic use within rap, if we can, if like when we're discussing rap as poetry, right? Um, and the clip that you included by Ice in Ice Cube's song was um, placing the gat in the mouth and unloading a 17 round, right? And considering how visible it is for us to see the brutalization of black communities what that actually does to short circuit that hyperbole right it's no longer a hyperbole but rather a reality and what it does to short circuit like the i want to say types of poetry like african american reality in rap as poetry rather than Shakespearean hyperbole, right? And what that does and how, um, and I'm thinking of something like um, um, in J. Cole, he talks about how um, the difference between um, uh, addiction issues in white communities versus black communities, right? In this past decade, it's been an issue because it is um, a suburban issue, but in the eighties, it was a predominantly African-American issue with addiction, with heroin, crack cocaine, but it only became this hyperbolic um, um, necessity to address once it hit like suburban homes. So what that hyperbole does, like what the short circuiting is in the poetry, in the rap, and that, that just really um, stood out to me because we think about like 17 rounds. Yes, like we can consider that's exaggeration, but you know, with Black Lives Matter, it really isn't, right? Um, we had that, um, I forget his name, unfortunately, um, in the car that he was shot nine times in the back, right? With his kids in the car, right? Eight minutes um, on George Floyd's neck, right? So these things aren't hyperbole anymore. So I just wanted to um, see if you can comment a little bit more on that. Um, yeah, I think that's a great point. We just had an episode in Brazil. Maybe Andrea can talk about it. I think it was the army. The army was patrolling the city for some reason. You guys may not even understand why the army is patrolling cities in Brazil. Uh, and they 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 shoot eighty something eighty something rounds in, in, into a car with a family. So yeah, in, in real life, it's not hyperbole. It is what it, it is what is happening. And in the album, that certificate, Ice Cube, uh, many times he says, uh, I'm, I'm coming back with a new payback. So it is a payback. So all the, all the, um, all the violence that has been um, become, that has become a reality, which is exaggerated by any standard, right? gives back with poetry and, and hyperbolis that it, uh, it's, it's probably, okay, this is what you, in reality, you hung us, you, you put the gat in your mouth and you just discharge the 17 rounds that you have. And I'm just doing that, but in a metaphorical uh, realm. Um, but it's 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 really hard to to not tie that to you know uh, the movies like <laughs> all the the popular culture or uh, the way the way these images and actions are incorporated by people in general and um, like I said everybody listens to have to have music right so. Um, But again, I. It is. Let's say it is a. Is it, a it is a reflection of what's happening in the streets, but in the opposite side, because they will accuse rap of being violent, right? But it's the opposite. Rap is just um, talking about what's happening in the streets. 
I hope I, I answered the question. It's a hard question to answer. Sorry. <laughs> it was more just a, a commentary, like um, if you had anything, um, because it was something that, you know, just really stood out where, um, yes, I'm thinking of, um, for example, like Tupac was such a poet in his own right. Um, the rose that grew from out of concrete. And this is something that, you know, it really isn't taught in academic circles because he's labeled under this like gangster rap, you know, these really violent um, representations of life, but um, that also um, precludes him from any sort of artistic um, right. So um, no, it's just, it just really interesting in terms of, you know, when we when we think of poetry, um, how this use of hyperbole, right, to to um, represent um, what is unimaginable, right. But these things are such a reality that, um, I don't know, it's just interesting to me that sort of short circuiting based on if you're white or if you're black. Yeah, I mean, again, the artist is is making us see, see reality again. <laughs> That's the reality of what's happening, and the artist is just making uh, making us see reality again. And uh, of course, we need to understand that as a uh, hyperbole. We interestingly, Tupac, I think he saw that himself. Uh, after a while, he was he said he was influenced by Shakespeare. <laughs> he started reading Shakespeare. I think I think that's Tupac. I think I'm not wrong. After um, some, at some point in his career, he, he, he found Shakespeare and he was actually um, how do you, draw, drawing from, from Shakespeare poetic ability. These guys, they are just extremely talented poets. They just use a different way of um, a different um, <clears throat> language, a different uh, raw material, very raw, <laughs> right? Uh, and they also use music, right? Or res resources from music. Any other questions? Mm. No?